With that said, I want to take you through chapter 9, verses 1 through 9 today, here in the book of, uh, book of Acts. And so let's begin reading together here in Acts chapter uh, 9. And uh, let's see. I'll just read verses uh, 1 through 9, and we'll get into our study. Acts chapter 9, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 9. Luke writes, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus. Suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. And Saul rose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. And so we're looking today at the man who was actually fighting against the Lord. We'll look at that in some detail as we go through the study. But let me begin by reminding you of a few things. In the New Testament, many people were touched by the Lord Jesus Christ, but they're only mentioned one time. They encounter him, yet either they remain unnamed or they're never mentioned again. They seem to simply disappear from the pages of Scripture. For example, when you think of the apostles, some of those men are well-known, at least by name, are, are well-known to us. You have Peter, James, and John. You have Andrew and Matthew, and, and those names ring a bell. We, uh, we know the names of those, those men, and we've seen their, their lives in the pages of Scripture, so they're fairly well-known to us. To a lesser degree, you'll, you'll know men like Philip or Thomas, but how much can we really say about Bartholomew or Thaddeus, uh, Simon the Zealot or James the son of Alphaeus or even Matthias who was chosen to replace Judas. Very little, if anything, is even mentioned of those men. If you just, those men, if you look in the Gospel of Matthew just as an example, uh, you can see that there are many whom Jesus ministered to only once. They're mentioned one time and you don't see them again. You have the wise men in, in chapter 2. In chapter 8, we have the leper that Jesus cleansed. We have the centurion and his, his servant boy that Jesus had healed. We have the healing of Peter's mother-in-law. We have the demonized men of the Gadarenes. I, I think of the paralytic who was brought to Jesus by four unnamed friends of Jairus and his unnamed daughter whom Jesus raised from the dead. The two blind men who received their sight. They're all mentioned in Matthew chapter 9. Nothing is said of them afterwards. In chapter 12, we see Jesus deliver an unnamed, a demon-possessed man who is also blind and mute. And in chapter 14, we're told of a young boy who donated his lunch. It, was, it resulted in the feeding of the 5,000. Chapter 15 introduced us to an unnamed Syrophoenician woman who begged Jesus to deliver her demonized daughter. And chapter 17 gives us the story of a father who brought his demon-possessed and suicidal son to Jesus Christ for deliverance, but you never see them again. They're introduced to us, but you don't see anything else of them. You can look in the Gospel of Luke and you read of a sinful woman who, who washed Jesus' feet with her tears. And we're all familiar with the story of how she came to Christ and he was there at supper and his, he was there at a man named Simon's house, a Pharisee. And we know the story of how she came, she wept, she washed his feet with her tears. And Jesus called our attention to the woman who was very sinful, but also because she'd been forgiven, very grateful. In John chapter 4, we have that touching story of a, an outcast woman at a well in Samaria. We have the woman who was caught in adultery that's spoken to us or spoken about to us in, in John chapter 8. All of these people have significant 
incidents, ex experiences with God, and, and yet each one of these people remain really unnamed after that particular introduction that we have. Many came into contact with Jesus. They had their stories recorded. They simply disappear. The last time we were together, we looked at an Ethiopian eunuch, an official who was saved, and then he disappears. He's gone. He came to faith in Jesus. He was baptized and, and then disappears from Scripture. The last thing we read of him is he went on his way rejoicing. That's it. So I thought of that as I was preparing this study, and I began to think of things that were contemporary, not, not necessarily of our, of our age, but that have happened within the last hundred years or so. We have Mel Trotter. Many don't know who he was. Mel Trotter was an alcoholic who, when his little girl died, stole the shoes she was to be buried in and sold them so that he might be able to buy alcohol and get, get drunk. But one night he staggered into the Pacific Garden Mission in Chicago and he, he was saved. He had a burden for those on Skid Row. So he began a rescue mission in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He went on to found more than 60 missions stretching from Boston to San Francisco. We have John Newton. Newton worked on slave ships, capturing slaves to sell to the plantations of the South. Eventually, he became a captain of his own ship, and after enduring a horrible storm, he was reading a, a Christian devotion that led to his conversion. Ultimately, he became a leader in evangelical Christianity, along with John and Charles Wesley, George Whitfield, and William Wilberforce, and it was Newton who wrote Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saved a Wretch Like Me. Newton wrote his own epitaph. It read, John Newton, clerk, once an infidel and libertine, a servant of slavers in Africa, was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith he had long labored to destroy. Church history is filled with stories of sinners transformed by Jesus Christ. As we've seen, some stories are known only to God, but others become well-known. But none of these conversions compare with the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, a man who was at war with God. So we can begin with a question, who was this man named Saul? Let me give you a little background of him so you can kind of get it. Uh, Saul was a Jewish man. He was born in Tarsus of Cilicia, which is modern Turkey. Tarsus was known for its university, which was equal to the university's of Athens as well as Alexandria, very famous universities in his day. Religiously, he was an extremely dedicated and intellectual Pharisee. And as a Pharisee, he studied in Jerusalem under the great rabbi Gamaliel. As you go through your scriptures, Saul, later called Paul, gave a glimpse of his religious life. And an example is found, for example, in the book of Philippians. In Philippians 3, 4 through 6, it says, If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I am more so, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. So he describes himself there in Philippians in a very detailed way. He says, I was circumcised. In other words, from birth, he was a child of the covenant. He was of the stock of Israel, means that he, meaning that he was not a Gentile convert. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. This is the tribe that remained faithful when the tribes had split from the, the northern and southern tribes. Israel's first king came out of Benjamin, so it was a tribe that held a lot of prestige in the nation of Israel. He was a Hebrew, he says, of the Hebrews, meaning he spoke Hebrew and he retained Jewish customs. He was a Pharisee, a member of the strictest religious sect in Judaism. He said, concerning zeal for my religion, I was a persecutor of the church. And concerning righteousness, I fanatically kept the law to its letter. Now, anybody reading of that would think that brings great advantage 
to somebody who is so religiously inclined. Yet he went on to say in the same book, Philippians 3, 7 through 9, he said, what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yes, indeed, I, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Everything that was looked at as being an advantage, I consider to be a loss to me. Ultimately, he said, they were all excess baggage on a sinking ship. I count them all lost. Why? I count them lost because the true treasure is knowing Jesus and the peace that comes through his grace. Well, in Acts chapter 8 at, at verse 1, speaking of the, the persecution to the death of Stephen, it says that Saul was consenting, which means pleased or in agreement with, with his death. And, and then it goes on to say, at, at that time a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. And so when the persecution arose, Saul was inflamed by it, and he joined in. And that's where we're picking up our study. It says in verse 1 here in chapter 9 that he was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. So this man was inflamed. Someone said he lived, as it were, in an atmosphere of threats and slaughter. It was the very air that he breathed. And his hatred didn't cool down. After Stephen's death, he desired more devastation. And it may have been growing and growing even worse after Philip evangelized the Samaritans. So he was consumed with hatred for all Christians, not just the leaders, but any believers. And he made it very clear. He made it clear when he was writing to the Galatians in chapter 1, verse 13. He said to them, you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God, and I tried, he says, to destroy it. Well, this man is breathing out threatenings, went to the high priest and asked letters, verse 2, from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were, on the way, uh, were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So he went and asked for authority to be able to arrest believers. You see, the, the high priest had authority over Jewish matters, and so he asked for these letters of authority and wanted to travel as far as Damascus, hunting down Christians. Now, when you look at a map, Damascus was the capital of Syria. It was 130 miles to the north, northeast of Jerusalem. It was on the heavily tra traveled trade route that connects the, the west with the east. And, and what he did, verse 2 says, is he obtained letters of authority so that he might destroy members. Notice how it says, of the way. I'll say this very briefly. Some of you already know this. Others perhaps don't. The Christians were not referred to as Christians until they were in Antioch. Prior to that, they were referred to as being members of the way. The way comes from John 14, 6, when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So these people were referred to not as Christians. They were members of what is called the way. And this is something that you'll see later on in Acts 19, verse 9, or chapter 22, verse 4, or chapter 24, verse 14. And so that's how the, the Christian faith was referred to as, as members of the way. And, and his mission was to take men or women believers and to bring them to Jerusalem so they could be tried and they could be punished. In Acts 22, 4 and 5, he, he speaks of this and he says, I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison, as also the high priest bears me witness and and all the counsel of the elders from whom I also received letters to the brethren and went to Damascus to bring in chains, even those who were there, to Jerusalem to be punished. In chapter 26, verses 9 through 11 of Acts, I indeed, he said, indeed I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem. 
many of the saints I, I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them, and I punished them often in every synagogue, compelled them to blaspheme, and being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Now, why would a devoutly religious man be so intent on wiping out members of the way? It would seem that he considered the gospel and their message to be heresy, error, blasphemous against God. In the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy 18, verse 20, it says, A prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. Blasphemy was a capital offense. He believed that they were blaspheming, therefore he received authority to put them in chains, bring them back, try them as heretics, and see them killed. Why is he going to Damascus? Well, Damascus had a large Jewish population. It was increased by the Christians who were seeking refuge there. Paul knew that there were Christians there, and he went to get them. It would have taken him about eight days walking to make the journey from Jerusalem. And so as he's on his way, verse 3 says, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Now at this point, God chooses to reveal himself to him. This incident is interesting to consider, contrasting it with the Ethiopian. We saw that the Ethiopian official had an obvious hunger and curiosity. He had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and he was returning to Ethiopia, and he was empty when he was brought to Christ by Philip there on that road. But on the other hand, Saul appears to have been satisfied with his religion. He was zealously content in the teachings, but he was missing out on truth. Proverbs 14, 12 says it like this. There's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. You can think what you're doing is the proper thing. You can think that your religion is a proper religion. You can believe that your faith is a proper faith. And you can be so strong about that that you actually argue with and, and even persecute those who disagree with you. That's what, what Saul was like. These were people who were well spoken of by the community, but he saw them as heretics. And they should, and their belief, their belief as well as themselves should be, should be forever exterminated. And so he receives the authority to go to arrest them, bring them back, try them as heretics, and oversee their death. There was a way that seemed right to him, but the end thereof was the way of death. So as he's doing this, verse 3 tells us, suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Now, later Paul says it was around noon when this happened. The light was incredibly brilliant. It was brighter than the sunlight. In Acts 26, 13, speaking to one called Agrippa, he said, at midday I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those who journeyed with me. Now, in the same chapter, chapter 9, verse 17, it says, Ananias went his way and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so what was taking place here was the one who he has seen was actually, actually Jesus. And he has seen him in his glorious light. Psalm 104 verses 1 and 2 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty who cover yourself with light as with a garment. And so he's seen actually an appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ there on his road to Damascus. And the appearance is only for Paul. Notice that the others with him didn't see him. Verse 4 tells us, it says, he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, notice how it says, the way this is written, he fell to the ground and heard a voice. This is Luke giving his report on what Saul heard. He's simply repeating what he's been told. But in Acts 26, 14, 
Paul gives his personal account of this experience, and there he makes it clear this was spoken in Hebrew. Acts 26, 14, he said, I heard a voice speaking to me in the Hebrew tongue. I want you to notice how it is God who initiates salvation. Saul wasn't seeking him. Saul was hunting Christians. He was not seeking God. He was seeking members of the way, but God was hunting him. He was not hunting after God, seeking after God. God was hunting down Saul. In John 6, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Jeremiah 31, 3, the Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. It wasn't Saul seeking God. It was God seeking Saul. This goes all the way back to the um, Garden of Eden when after the fall, after they had taken of the forbidden fruit, they heard the voice of the Lord and the Lord cried out, Adam, where are you? It was not Adam seeking out God. It was God seeking out Adam. That's how you got saved. I've heard people speak and say, you know, I was lost and this and that and, and uh, you know, and then I found God. You know, I was this, I did that and then I found God. God wasn't lost. It wasn't like he was hiding somewhere in a room waiting for you to open the door and say, there you are, God. No, he was seeking you. Even as you were running from him, he was pursuing you. The Holy Spirit has been referred to as the hound from heaven. He's pursuing you. Some people get so upset. Why is this happening to me? Why do these things happen to me? Why are these things going the way they are? How come? It's because the Lord is pursuing you. And he's not going to allow you to find satisfaction. Your heart is going to be restless until it finds peace in him. And so he seeks you in order that he might convict you, in order that you might see him and come to him so he can say, I have drawn you with loving kindness. And that's what's happening with Saul. He's out there chasing down Christians while God is chasing him down. This amazing man that God is going to save. He fell to the ground. He heard a voice. Why are you persecuting me? And in his mind, he's not persecuting God. He's helping God. How much evil has been done in our attempt to help God? And he's helping God. In his mind, in John 16, verse 2, Jesus said this, they will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think that they're offering a service to God. And that was Saul. Now, his namesake, he was named after the first king of Israel, King Saul. King Saul persecuted David by his persecution of Christians. He's actually persecuting the son of David. He's persecuting Jesus. And Jesus makes it clear, when you persecute one of my followers, I take it personally. You are persecuting me. You see, by harming and rejecting my followers, you have been rejecting me. And so as he's speaking and saying these things, he's really being am he's amazed. Notice verse 5 where it says, he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. Now, I want to develop that for just a moment. Who are you, Lord? Now, when he says Lord the first time, the word Lord can be used like the word sir. It's, it's a, a term of respect, a title of respect. That's all it is. And in this particular case, at first, that's all he's saying. He's, call, he's speaking to someone who's greater than himself, if you will, and he calls him Lord out of respect. Now, he's not fully recognizing Jesus as the Lord yet. And so the question is asked, he says to him, who are you, Lord? Identify yourself so I know who I'm speaking. And then Jesus says to him, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. I'm Jesus. I'm the one you're persecuting. I'm the one Stephen spoke about resulting in his death with your approval. I'm the one that you've been forcing people to blaspheme. I'm the one that you have hated and have resisted. But I am also the one who laid down my life for you, that you might be saved. 
I'm the one who's going to be your final judge, and I'm the one that you now are on your face before. Later on, Paul would say, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that's what he's doing there. He's on his face before. Who am I? I'm the one you've been persecuting. I'm the one who died on that cross. I'm the one who was buried. I'm the one who was resurrected. I'm the one who ascended. I'm the one who sends the Holy Spirit. I'm the one who has filled the lives of these people you're persecuting. Who am I? I am your Lord. He doesn't know what to do. Then he says in verse 5, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. When you read that, people will know what that is if you, if you work with animals and all like that. Uh, a, sharp, it's, a goat is a sharp iron or wooden stick that's on a wagon that keeps the beast from backing up. Saul, it is hard for you to resist the gospel because in the end, your resistance only produces wounds. I've been in the ministry for a long time. I've been a Christian for a long time now. I have never met anybody yet. Maybe somebody in this room will, will be the first. I have never met anyone yet who's ever walked up to me and said to me, I wish I'd have waited longer. I wish I would have taken my time and gotten saved. I, I wish I'd have partied a little bit more. I wish I'd have had more opportunities to drink. I, I wish I'd have slept with more people. I, I wish that I'd have spent more time in prison. I, I've never met anybody like that who's ever told me that they regret coming to Christ when they did other than when they say it like this. They say, I wish I would have come to faith in Christ sooner. Why? Because I would have saved myself from so many wounds. I would have saved myself from so many so much pain, and I would have saved others from the wounds that I inflicted on them. Wish to God that I came to faith in Christ as a child. I was only 20. I was young, but you know what? In those 20 years, I had a lot of opportunities to hurt a lot of people and to hurt myself too, and I, and I often think about that. I used to in the past more often, and I'd say, would to God that I had to come to faith in Christ earlier. I wouldn't have hurt my parents the way I did, my family the way I did, the girls I dated the way I did, my friends the way I did, the things that I've done, the harm I've caused other people. Would to God I had to come to, to faith in Him. And you know what? You're ending up wounded when you're waiting. If the Lord is calling you and you're fighting Him, you're wounding yourself. You need to come to faith in Christ. You need to surrender to him. He can bring healing to your life and change your life the way he did with Saul. This is a man at war with God. And, he, and God says to him, Jesus says to him, it is hard for you. You keep wounding yourself as you're backing away. You need to come to faith so that you can be healed and no longer be wounded. And so he's speaking to him in this way. And as he's speaking to him, it just begins to amaze him what's going on. Now, I want to show you something here. You see, the first time he uses the word Lord, he, he is simply showing respect. But in verse 6, he's trembling and astonished. And he says, Lord, what do you want me to do? This time he's calling him Lord, revealing. He recognizes who this is that he's speaking to. Now notice he first asks, who are you? Then he asks, what do you want me to do? This is the proper order to follow. When you come to know who he is, then you ask him, what am I to do? I want to know who you are, and then I want to know what you want from me. Sometimes people, when they're come to a, they come to a knowledge of who the Lord is, is, they begin to move out to do things, and sometimes those things are good. I think when a brand new person, when someone comes to faith in Christ, and they're, they're so overjoyed that it's an important thing for them to give away their faith. They should. You should talk about what the Lord has done in your life, but you do it in, in a way with an awareness that you don't know that much. You just know you were once blind, now you see. You were once lost, and now you're found. You once were spiritually dead, and now you're alive. And that's pretty much what you can do. When I first got saved, like many of the kids in the Jesus movement, when I first got saved, I, I really didn't know how to 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 present the gospel yet i had just been saved so what i would do is i would just bring them to a place where somebody who was more qualified could help them it's like the woman at the well when she spoke to the men and said come here a man who's told me all things that i've ever done can this be messiah 
It's just the invitation. Bring them and so they can hear. I, I'm not yet ready and capable. Well, I think that's a good thing. But in this case, I know I share some things with you. If you want to be used by the Lord, be very quick to obey what he has to say. I want you to see this. It's very important how, how this is uh, pointed out to him. Again, in verse 6, he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, arise, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Arise, go into the city. That's a simple command. Get up and go to Damascus and wait. Paul's world-changing ministry began, this is a very important point, with a simple act of obedience. The world-changing ministry of Paul began with a simple act of obedience. Go and wait, and you'll be told. Go and wait, and you will be told. Paul eventually was the one who writes and says, I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything. I want the name of Christ to go everywhere. I, I want to take the name of Jesus to places that have never heard it. And that's exactly what he does. I want to go to Rome. And that's what he does. He wants people to know Jesus Christ. But you need to wait so you can be told what to do. And, and that's a simple command. So his world-changing ministry begins by obedience to the simple thing. You'll never do the difficult until you're faithful in the little. If you want to be used by the Lord, I hope that all of us do, if you want to be used by the Lord, then you just obey the simple. My first Bible studies had my mom and my dad. They had to be there. It was at their house. And there were two or three neighbors. That was my first Bible study. Four or five people. If you're faithful in that which is least, you'll be faithful in that which is much. And for years from that point on, I've always taught as if I'm speaking to four or five people. That's how it works. You're not looking for multitudes. You're simply looking to somebody who will listen. And the Lord says, you need to listen. You need to learn. You need to wait. And then you'll be told. And so this worldwide missionary, the Apostle Paul, the most famous man, he wrote 13 of the New Testament books, the most famous man. He's quoted in every Christian church, at least every Christian church, at least once during a sermon. The Apostle Paul, the one with the tremendous influence that he had, began his ministry by simply being obedient. Great works always begin with obedience to small things. One day there was a shoe salesman by the name of Edward Kimball. And Edward Kimball shared the gospel with a young man who went on to become the great evangelist D.L. Moody. Moody held a campaign in the British Isles. And a young man came to Jesus by the name of F.B. Meyer, who, who went on to become a pastor and author in England. In one of his services, a young man named Wilbur Chapman got saved, who later led a young American to the Lord named Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday went on to become an evangelist, and he led an outreach to businessmen, including a young man who would become an evangelist by the name of Mordecai Ham. At one of Mordecai Ham's meetings was a young man from South Carolina. He gave his heart to Christ and went on to become Billy Graham. It starts with the small thing. You don't know who you're influencing. As Americans, I think we have a problem, and that is that we think we're like salesmen with the gospel, and so if I don't close the sale, if they don't pray, then nothing's happened. If they don't receive Christ, then nothing's happened, and that's just not true. That's not true at all, because you never know who you're influencing. You may be speaking to the person here, and somebody over here is listening. This person over here that you're so intent on wanting to see come to faith does it, but this person over here that you don't even know is listening and does. I, I was at a, a pastor's conference, teaching at a conference in Colorado a few years ago now, and, and a man walks up to me, and he says, Pastor David, he says, you don't know me. He says, but I'm a pastor here in Colorado. I said, well, great. It's nice to meet you. He says, no, let me tell you something. He says... <clears throat> You taught at a, at a men's retreat in Virginia several years ago. And 
at, the, at that retreat, I gave my heart to Christ. He says, and I followed the Lord. I've grown in the things of the Lord, and now I'm a pastor. I'm pastoring out here in Colorado. I just wanted you to know that my salvation came through an invitation that you gave. And I said, well, I hope you have a good church. Because if it's a bad one, I don't want to take the blame for that. <laughs> no. <laughs> I have another guy. I meet with him. His name is Ryan. I, he's one of the pastors. I meet with several pastors every couple of months. And Ryan is one of the men who, who meets with me. He's a pastor, Calvary Chapel pastor. But he approached me when I first met him and told me that. He said, I was at, uh, he said, I went to Calvary Chapel Golden Springs. He said, you came as a, um, as a guest speaker. You gave an invitation. He said, I gave my heart to Christ. I didn't see him come forward at the invitation. And now he's pastoring a church at Calvary Chapel Ministry. You never know who you're impacting. You never really know. I've been on airplanes where the stewardess has said, is that David Rosales? I recognize his voice. I've been, I've been, in, I don't, it's not about me right now. I'm trying to illustrate how you never know who you influence. There are people that you're working with right now that you don't even know are watching you. Years ago, story time, years ago, I used to work in a place in Huntington Park. There were two girls that worked in another office. I worked in, in shipping, and they worked in accounting. And I had to go into that office every once in a while. And I walked into the, into the office, and one of the women, I was a young man, at that time, just really newly married. And I walked in, and when I walked into the office, one of the ladies spoke to me, and I got to know them. Hi, how are you? And I walked in, and on this one occasion, one of the women said to me, my parents are gone. You live in Norwalk. I live in Downey. My parents are gone. You ought to come and pick me up in Birmingham to work. And I smiled at her and suddenly went deaf, and I walked out of the room. And I called Maria, Mommy, a bad girl's after me, you know, so. <laughs> Her friend was named Teresa. When our church began, it was like 82 or 83. When our church began, I was outside, and here comes Teresa whom I used to work with, and she said, I thought it was you. I heard that you had started a church out here. She said, I just wanted to come and say hello to you and to tell you, I remember you from when we worked together. She said, but I got saved. I go to Raul Reese's church now. And I said, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> Glad you're here. But you never know. That's the point I'm trying to make. You never know Who's listening when you're talking? You never know. Sometimes you'll be speaking to somebody about the Lord and somebody else over here is listening. And later on, they say, whatever you did in his life, please do it in mine. That's how my sister, I told you this recently, but that's how my sister Madeline got saved. I came home the day I got saved. She said, what happened? I said, I came to faith in Christ. I'm born again. And that's when she put her head on her pillow that night and said, whatever you did for him, please do for me. You never know. And it always starts with the small thing. Don't think that, oh, if I just open the Bible, thousands will show up. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. More than likely, they won't. But if there's one or two or three that are willing to hear you share, you don't know how your ministry will expand. I have a friend of mine, his name is John. And John's a pastor in a Calvary ministry. And John says that a young man left his church, was his worship leader, and went to another state and began a Bible study. And he said, he would write me and he'd say, I have 100 people showing up. And John, whose church was around 900, would write and say, keep it up, see what the Lord does. The guy would write again, I've got 400. The guy began to write again, I've got uh, 800. He said everything was good until he said, I've got 1,000. Now I'm feeling bad, and what's God doing with him? And the young man that was writing and telling him, the Lord is using me, and I'm, blessed, I'm, I'm being blessed, is Skip Heitzig, who has like 16,000 members in his church in Albuquerque. God can use the most insignificant 
He can do that if you're open. Saul did not know that he would become Paul. He just knew that he was breathing out threatenings against followers of Jesus Christ. He was persecuting them to the death. And then Christ arrested him. And Christ took him into custody. Who is he? I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. What am I to do? You need to go and you need to wait. And it will be told you. Now in verse 7 it says, The men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no one. They heard a voice. They didn't understand the words because the words were only for Saul. Again, that happens very often when people are saved. God will be speaking to one person. The other person doesn't hear it at all. God's words are not understood by those with no interest in him. Again, the message that results in salvation often pushes people out the door. And so Saul arose, verse 8. He arose from the ground. His eyes were open. He saw no one. They led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. So he was stricken with temporary blindness. He was led into the city. And that's a different way of entering the city than he planned. He was being led by the hand like a little boy. He wasn't coming in with all the ferocious authority that he had to take people and put them in jail. He was being led by the hand. In Psalm 25, 9, it says, He guides the humble in what is right. He teaches them his way. God broke Saul. And he arose from the ashes, the greatest man God ever used. He was humbled before the Lord, whom he so fervently opposed. And he was three days without sight. He didn't eat and he didn't drink. Now, in this time of blindness and fasting, Paul rethought how he felt about Jesus. And later he, in 1 Timothy 1, verses 13 through 15, said this. He said, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. He was broken. I'll close with a couple of thoughts. Do you want to be used by the Lord? Then whom the Lord uses, he first breaks. Why? So the excellence of the knowledge may be of Christ and not of himself. God will break you. Then he heals you. Then he uses you. Keep that in mind. Because many will not allow the breaking. God does not use the arrogant. God shows his grace to the humble. And when Paul, this great man, this man has been called the greatest. He was the greatest thinker, the greatest intellectual. He learned under the greatest teacher of his day, Gamaliel. This was the Pharisee of the Pharisees. He wasn't just some guy. He was the guy that everybody knew. He was the up-and-coming superstar. And his fervor was so intense that people feared him. They said, it's okay to love the Lord, but man, this guy kills people in his name. This guy is crazy. And the others would say, no, this man is zealous. This man is, is fervent. This man has great faith. This is the kind of man we need today. And Saul says, no, I was the chief of sinners. Humility is a place where God begins to use you. Don't forget that, please, because we have a tendency today in the church of honoring the proud and saying, oh, that's a, no. What is greatness in the sight of God? Jesus spoke of it. I am meek, I am humble, I'm lowly. Jesus was not weak because sometimes we think of weakness as, uh, meekness as weakness. No, meekness is strength that's under control. Some of the baddest dudes you'll ever meet, the baddest, baddest of the bad, are the nicest guys you'll ever meet because they know what they can do and they don't have to prove it to anybody. They don't have to run around acting like they're seven feet tall, 390 pounds. 
They just know what they can do. And people who get to know them know what they can do. And they respect them because they don't do what they could do. Well, how about Jesus? Do you think he'd be UFC champion? I think so. I think so. Moses was one bad dude. He looked to the left, looked to the right. He saw a, a, a taskmaster as he was uh, abusing one of his brethren and looked to the left, looked to the right, and then promptly killed him, buried him. No problem. Why? Because he was learned it in all the wisdom and the knowledge of the Egyptians. What does that include? Martial arts. This was one of the baddest dudes in Egypt. That's why when that Egyptian taskmaster, which was a big, mean, ferocious person, it doesn't say Moses thought, hmm, I better size this guy up. Where's his weakness? He just says he looked to the right and then boom, you're dead. I'll just bury you. It's over. God had to take him and put him in a wilderness for 40 years because the first 40 years he thought that they would know he's the deliverer and God said, no, not in your strength. It's not by... It's not by might nor by power. It's by my spirit, Moses. You're going to have to learn a lesson. I'm going to put you in the wilderness, and I'm going to have you with those stinky sheep for 40 years because you're going to have some more problems later on with some of my stinky sheep. And I'm going to teach you humility. You want to be used by the Lord? Then see yourself for what you are, a sinner saved by God's grace. That's what you are. That's what you are. You're no better. You're no better. You're no better. We all need his grace. And that's why he would say, I'm chief of sinners. I'm the worst. You will go and you will learn when you wait. Then you're going to be told what to do. And I will show you how I will use you. And this man will see this. This man, he told, uh, God said, is going to suffer many things for my name's sake. He is going to go through breaking for the rest of his life. To the point when you read Second Timothy, what is it he says in the last chapter? All have forsaken me and left me. I only have a handful of people who have stayed faithful. I will break him, break him, break him to the end so that he stays faithful, faithful, and humble. That's how it works in the kingdom of God. In the book of Acts, he made it very clear that he was willing to do anything for the Lord. In Acts 21, 13, he said this, I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Not only will I live for him, but to die is gain, because I will be with him. So the man at war with God came to fully surrender to the love of God. And that's what we're called to do ourselves. Father, we ask.